Steve Mera. Welcome to Nature of Reality Radio. A fascinating guest indeed seeing what I'm seeing on these websites. You cover a whole slew of fascinating <laughs> subjects uh, with Phenomena magazine. Um, I'd like to ask what uh, if you're the founder of that magazine and also what else you do with that. But before that, let me just get these disclaimers out that I said I need to give out to all my mm-hmm. listeners. I know I sound like a broken record. Uh, many of you may have heard this, but uh, I need to get this out this show and maybe three more times. Uh, first of all, I did get a message from YouTube uh, about a month ago saying your channel has a lot of spam. We need to look into this. And I think that's a, another way of telling me that we don't like what you're putting up on YouTube because your show and your channel exposes stuff that the powers that be don't want people we don't want people listening to. So uh, have me in your prayers, everybody, and hope that this show does not get kicked off YouTube. If it does, I'll find another medium to upload shows for it to continue. And the second thing I just want to point out for all those listeners who are getting really, really sick and tired of having to listen to my shows the past two and a half years with my voice in one earphone, if you were listening with headphones and listened to my voice in one earbud and the, uh, the guest voice in the other earbud, that was my bad. All that time I had the MP3 Skype recorder on stereo. I did not realize that was the problem. I should have had it on mono mode. Nobody ever said anything to me about it, but I have it on mono mode right now. And all those shows that I did over the past two and a half years... I recommend not listening to them using headphones because you're going to have to deal with my voice in one ear and the guest voice in the other. Um, If you have to listen to headphones, hey, it's just a little little slight problem, nothing to bitch about too much. It is what it is, and, uh, well, from now on, all shows won't have to deal with that problem. So that's uh, what I wanted to get out, and... Now that um, I'm going to give you the floor to introduce yourself, what you do, what exactly uh, did you create Phenomena Magazine, or are you like yeah. someone who carries on the Legacy <laughs> Magazine and uh, and everything else that you do, and then um, tell us your, your life story, what you experienced that caused you to talk about all these different things that you talk about, and then we'll go from there and let our angels and guides decide which topics are the best and worthy mm-hmm. of discussing in these two hours that we have. So you got the floor. Okay, well, first, Andrew, I want to say thank you for having me on. Uh, absolute pre- pleasure. And uh, it's I hear the same thing all the time about the suppression of this type of information. So credit to yourself and the others that are still trying to continue battle the system. I am aware of hundreds of people are having this problem, uh, the squeeze on the subject, and, of course, the domineering platforms. Uh, it is the way society is moving that there is, obviously, uh, it's very difficult to get crucial information out uh, nowadays and we know this ourselves from uh, dealing with video management across these platforms as you've mentioned uh, and the subsequent people which have been having problems with demonetization loss of channels uh, and basically being taken from search results Um, this is an ongoing problem which we're aware of Uh, it's happening not to yourself but it's also happening to us and many many others Many people are aware of this problem. It's a growing concern about how we are supposed to distribute this information in the future. So I will certainly try my best uh, to get all the crucial details out tonight. (laughs) Um, You first mentioned about Phenomena magazine. Uh, It it started off about 15 years ago as uh, an in-house magazine for the organization Manchester's Aerial Phenomena Investigation Team based here in the UK. It's about one of the fifth oldest running organizations in the country. Uh, formulated by Dr. David Rees in 1973. I took over it, uh, I believe, in around about the latter, the latter 1980s, early 1990, um, after he passed away. And, of course, you can imagine the archive that we've got. We have wonderful archives of these great stories from the 1970s of these uh, contact cases and UFO incidents, UFO sightings. So um, I've always had a long interest in the subject for oh, as, as far as I can remember back to be honest with you. And uh, I wanted to make sure that we could distribute a some information free of charge to people within our organization. But it became uh, a high demand product. People were asking for it who weren't part of the organization. Uh, so we ended up producing the magazine to, to generally the, the the, the general public uh, who required the magazine, we had that sent to them. It became an e-zine. It was initially a printed magazine uh, for the first year or two. Then because of distribution and we wanted to get it out into the, the furthest regions of our of our planet, should we say, uh, the best way forward is, is e-zine. And I think most people who are listening to the show will agree that kind of might be the way the future of magazines is going. I know even the top magazines like Vogue and, uh, and, and magazines like that also have a digital 
digital format of their own magazine now as well as a shop shelf one. So it does seem that that's the way forward to distribute information widely. So we decided to launch an e-zine and as time grew over the years, um, people wanted it in their own countries. There was a big demand in it for it to be in Spanish and, and, and other languages. So as time went on, we, we obtained further editors, a standalone issues of Phenomena magazine, which we coordinate from the head office in here in Manchester in the UK. Uh, and now we're distributed in 12 countries, four languages, and uh, it's free. All you would need to do is go to phenomenamagazine.co.uk, go to back issues, they're all there to view uh, and read and download and just click on them. Uh, and it's it's free information to distribute. We, 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 we're we still very strong believers that important information does need to be distributed. There shouldn't be a charge for information and knowledge it's, uh, and good knowledge, you know, uh, keeping away from the fake news and the, and the dis, you know, the disinformation that is a, uh, that circulates the internet nowadays. We try and put, be very, uh, very strict in regarding the research, the material that goes in there. And, uh, and we like to get as much information as we possibly can. And we do that every month at the end of each month as a new issue is distributed. Um, that alone uh, is quite timely. You can well imagine doing a month magazine most magazines running about two or three months now um, but we like to put out on a regular basis because things are reported regularly so we like to be hot on the topic should we say uh, apart from that um, I started in the subject of ufology very young my father was was into books like a very von Daniken and Brad Steiger and I remember reading I remember as a child uh, my friends were reading comic books and I was reading very von Daniken <laughs> and uh, it was in my blood it was in my father's blood he was interested in the subject and uh, I kind of adopted that interest and when I left school uh, I was determined that I wanted to join an organization learn more and really become some have an active role in this uh, in this research I wanted to I had all these questions that needed answering and of course back then I mean I've been at this now for 36 years 37 years nearly and back then the the people who I met, the mentors I had in the UK were were teaching me that the UFO phenomena constitutes uh, something which is extraterrestrial in origin. Um, it's a very nuts and bolts craft. It's traveling probably the linear of, uh, through space from another planet. And this was a very feasible thing to accept back then. <clears throat> but as time has gone on, we've quickly realized that it's so, so much more that uh, this phenomenon represents a very uh, metaphysical phenomena, uh, paranormal as attributes, uh, as well as uh, the theory of it being more interdimensional than extraterrestrial knowledge. Uh, and of course, it's thrown this whole new research into the paradigm now of, uh, of questioning, really, what are we dealing with with this phenomenon? What's it truly represent? What's its true capabilities? And how long has this phenomenon been with us? I mean, so the evidence would suggest that this is not a new phenomenon. If anything, we're probably the new kids on the block, to be honest with you. Um, this phenomenon seems, if you go back, it seems to even probably even predate historical documentation, which means that there has always been a presence of something like this around under different names, has different masks. And of course, people have called this many, many different things over the years. Uh, as we refer to it today, is the the new version is the uh, is an aerial phenomena or UAP, uh, but we still, I believe, are far from fully understanding what the true phenomena represents. And as I've mentioned, uh, the paranormal attributes to this are recognisable because after spending probably 12 to 15 years in the subjects of ufology, I pretty much exhausted everything I could learn in this country an example um, I read every single book I could get my hands on exhausted libraries and I just had this craving for data and uh, and as time went on I realized that there were vast areas which still needed researching um, there was the obviously the the uh, metaphysical side of this phenomena um, which we've learned more over the past five years than we have at any other time regarding that uh, that type of subject and of course, the psychic or you might say conscious connection with this phenomena. And because of those attributes, I became interested in the paranormal. <clears throat> uh, and I decided to launch myself into paranormal research quite heavily after learning as much as I could on ufology. 
And I became fascinated in, in that subject alone simply because I was seeing what we refer to as identifiers between both types of phenomena, uh, be it from the alien abduction, bedroom visitations and, and sleep paralysis, um, to the uh, to seeing the apparitions of dark figures in bedrooms and people reporting paralysis, uh, strange light phenomena and, and all sorts of things which you could consider are not only fall in the realms of the paranormal but also the ufological. And I was very keen in studying the connections between these two anomalous subjects and found not just hundreds but thousands of related bridges between these two things and realized very quickly that the research into ufology has been very much lingered over the years because of the lack of the information in credible reports about the paranormal attributes to some of this ufological stuff if we even cast our minds back to project blue book and the reports that were that were documented by blue book though that they were very poor because blue book certainly had an agenda to only please the public and and to tell them one certain type of conclusion that those reports when you go back and look at them you will find after conducting further research that people did report paranormal attributes people were having paranormal encounters and sometimes very closely associated to their ufo experience but at the time the academics um, at that time really didn't want to get involved in that aspect of the subject there were, seems that they were quite happy to accept and I acknowledge the possibilities of extraterrestrial life visiting us from some distant planet than the possibility of getting into all that ghost stuff, as the science guys would say. So that was kind of missed out and taken out of reports. And it was a very important aspect of this phenomenon that we do need to recognize, do need to acknowledge. And of course, that opens up new areas of research uh, for which I've been involved in quite heavily over the last five years. Learning about the paranormal is very, it's a, it's a tricky business because you've got the kind of the entertainment side, the ghost hunters, and, and that's all very entertaining uh, when their top of the list is we want to capture evidence. But it's the question is, is where do we go from there? Uh, and it's no doubt people are photographing and videoing and capturing unusual anomalies. If it's an audible phenomena, be it EVP or instrumental transcommunication, whatever that they want to refer to it as, it is anomalous. It is known by parapsychological departments that there is anomalous phenomena like this um and the problem of that is that where do we go with that where where how further can we go once we've got the data uh, can it be looked at scrutinized bench tested replicated so on and so forth and to look at this in the scientifically we need to be able to do a certain amount of things like that and uh, to try and find out exactly what we are dealing with to really get a good grasp of the paranormal, one has to obviously realise very quickly that we need to understand what the human capabilities are. So for me, I, um, I decided to learn behavioural sciences in psychology and then went on to do numerous different power psychology courses uh, from around the world. Uh, they're certainly varied. I wanted to do it from around the world because they are varied different things and different teachings and different beliefs put into these subjects. And though that many academic societies still consider the whole aspect of totally pseudoscience. Um, we have had some amazing leading breakthroughs in this, uh, in this type of research, that um, human consciousness certainly seems to be affect the environment. Um, and we have a precognition um, abilities through numerous different ways, be it uh, uh, totally psychological or even physiological, such as our skin reacting to certain things which are due to happen within the next, so say, minute or so. Tests have been carried out like this, and it, it, we are finding that human beings are exceptional, exceptional creatures, and we have this wonderful, wonderful techniques that sometimes we take just for granted. And we say the quirky or the strange little incidents, but there's so much more to it than that. And that led me into conducting serious research in regarding the uh, the continuations of the Skoll experiment. The Skoll experiment was something that took place in a location called Skoll in Norfolk in the UK uh, many years ago and involved the Society of Psychical Research, very uh, prestigious establishment at that time, and uh, numerous scientists and professors and doctors, and it was regarding spiritual communication or what they referred to as spiritual communication at that time. Um, nowadays, we, we, we would really 
stress that it's very difficult to actually um, say that it's for sure it is actual spiritual uh, the phenomena we certainly it is intelligent and communicates um, however its source remains a big question mark and the reasons for this is that because the parapsychological departments will say that there is no evidence for the afterlife and, and rightly so there, there doesn't seem to be and the reasons why they say this is because the people who have communications they 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 can maybe see something uh, a family member passed away or or they they think that they're conversing with a family member is the problem is is that we know through scientific um, tests and experiments that this intelligent communications that take place can obtain the information from us in fact, they've answered questions even before we've uh, we've posed them. Uh, they know the information from us. Um, they've also given information pertaining to future events that seem to have come true. So we have to question, how are we supposed to know, how are we supposed to prove that what we are communicating is a spirit? And this is the biggest problem, and the power psychology departments know this. They know that really, when the cards are on the table, we cannot prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is a spiritual phenomena. What we can prove is that, yes, this is very intelligent. Um, it, uh, it can obtain information from literally our thoughts and seem to have a knowledge of future events as so, to some degree. And if we can, if we look at all those, then we cannot say for sure that what we are obtaining is legitimately a spirit. Therefore, we have to say we don't have enough evidence to support it. And that's why parapsychology departments go on to say, you know, there's no proof of afterlife. Uh, um, and for us, it's very frustrating, as you can well imagine, because we may be witnessing this phenomena, we may be gathering data on this phenomena, but we can't truly say what it represents. And it's an ongoing thing, and it's something that's been going on for a very long time, even though that we have better equipment now to, to achieve these, uh, these studies and get results. Um, the conclusions still remain somewhat of, of, of numerous question marks. Um, but after studying so much, uh, studies in the paranormal and parapsychological, I joined up with a number of um, of specialists and formulated something referred to as Phenomena Project. Phenomena Project was to continue the experiments to see how far we can actually push this phenomena, what can we learn about the communications, uh, what are the abilities, how, you know, what, what are they capable of doing? And it would seem that there were manif they have the capabilities of manifestations of light or physical objects. Um, and of course, the communications vary from instant answers as if like they, they have the, ha the capabilities of tapping into some Akashic record. They just seem to be able to deliver a responsive answer within seconds. We, the problem is sometimes the, the more profound question you ask, it's very difficult to conclude if the answer is correct. You know, you can ask, ask some very strange questions, but can you check the result at the end of the day? So you've always got to keep that in mind. And it's very demonstrable, but we don't know really what we're dealing with. But what we found and what the Skoll experiment found and what Phenomena Project found was there was a correlation between the paranormal seances, you could say, and what might be referred to as ET channeling or communications with things that claim they are extraterrestrial or interdimensional beings uh, coming from other planets or are from other planets. Um, it simply is tied in with the, the generalistic versions, what you might see of what science might represent. These studies went on considerably for about four to five years with the Phenomena Project and some amazing data. It was kept from the public initially um, because we wanted to accumulate as much information, gather as much conclusive data as we possibly can before we put that out to any scientific establishments or organizations. Uh, eventually, we, we documented everything that we had, we pushed this out, and of course, that led to a, a whole new regime of research in the subject, back into the subject of ufology. So what I did is I've stepped out of ufology after 10 to 15 years into the paranormal and parapsychology for a lengthy time, and now we've come full circle and got back into you the ufological because what we've done now is we are what we're doing is reassessing the subject of ufology in the 21st century which means that we are eliminating all the barriers 
all the barriers that were present, all the boxes that people and scientists have created, putting these phenomena into these different boxes, keeping the separation between the metaphysical and the spiritual, um, and, and of course the paranormal and the supernatural and the ufological, and the, and the list goes on. Because we cannot do that. To look and understand the phenomena as a general, we have to break those barriers down. We have to look at the subject as a whole. And now we're doing that. We're starting to come across new data, new forms of research, which seems to point into something quite profound. It is not just as simple as a, uh, a strange light or craft in the sky. There is so much more. It's associated with the psychic ramifications of those experiences, people having a conscious connection with the, uh, with the phenomena. That is evident on many occasions. Firstly, with the results from the uh, the dual slit or double slit experiment, knowing that we change a situation, the electrons within a, any items, when we look at them, when they're observed, they act differently. Which led me into the question of why do we not see things manifest in poltergeist infestations, as an example? It's always seen just after arrival or just in flight or just arrived and but we don't tend to see the action occur and we wanted to look into the aspects of are we somehow affecting the action by observing it which led us in obviously into the studies of the dual slit experiment but then it went further because we know that during the 1980s in the UK we had a quite a number of severe UFO flaps, we might call them, uh, certain places around the country where had an intense amount of UFO activity over a short period of time. And the British Air Force, a number of pilots, had been given the order for the shoot down in certain locations. In other words, should you come across an object in this location and it is und un uh, you have no shadow of doubt that it is unidentified and should not be there, then you have access to to open fire on this on this object. It was only a short lived program, but a number of pilots were given the shoot down order and a number of pilots did encounter some of these objects. And when they did, they were through the routines told to engage. And when they went to engage, what they found very quickly was just prior to being able to even put weapon lock on one of these objects, it would suddenly do an evasive maneuver until the pilot would try and gain control of the aircraft to put weapon lock on this object again and again this object would counter maneuver with an evasive uh, mover out of, out of the way very quickly and this was going on for quite some time until they quickly realized that they couldn't get ahead of this phenomena every time they wanted to try and do something like this it would always do an evasive maneuver and they realized that it's li very likely that the, the phenomena had some type of conscious connection with the observers, be it the pilots, and very likely that the sum of this phenomena was somehow reading the pilot's intent and taking countermeasures to avoid any problems. This has also been documented uh, and backed up by some of the United States Air Force encounters uh, on numerous occasions which led to our research into the conscious connection between the observers and the UFOs. Even just witnesses at ground level, it doesn't have to be pilots, could be anybody, but there would seem that on many occasions when we interview people who have had experiences, sightings, encounters, that they seem that they're drawn to a certain place, could be looking, just get up and suddenly look out of a window for no reason and hey presto, there is a UFO in the sky. And these continued experiences happen over and over again and they are reported not in the hundreds but in the thousands where there is evidence that this phenomena has some type of conscious connection with the observers we wanted obviously to look at that in more depth the psychic ramifications and of course we realized very quickly through data and research gathering that there are many cases with the with the paranormal attributes still taking place very frequently now, there's been a lot of talk recently about uh, the further investigations which are taking place at Skinwalker Ranch, which is all, which was once referred to as Sherman Ranch in the United States, uh, in Utah. And many people know the name Skinwalker Ranch. They've heard stories. They may have seen the documentary. There's plenty of information on the Internet about Robert Bigelow's involvement in this ranch, along with the NIDS, 
the uh, which was a scientific organization he was running uh, which consisted of uh, academics and scientists trying to answer one of the principal things at that ranch and that is what the phenomena represented for them it was extremely difficult because they realized very quickly how hard it was to gather evidence because they they knew phenomena was taking place sometimes it was witnessed with human eyes but they wanted to record they wanted data they wanted to be able to record this photograph it scrutinize that and this is where they first had their the biggest hurdle the biggest problem was that trying to capture this phenomenon was extremely difficult because it was hyper evasive in other words phenomena was taking place for three days solid in one particular field they set up a cctv camera in that field to leave it running and it the phenomena transversed to another field so they thought, OK, we'll take the cameras down and we'll set them up in another field. And of course, the phenomena did exactly the same again. So they thought, OK, we'll we'd be clever about this and we'll set up cameras all over the fields because one way or another, we're going to capture this. And when they did that, they found the cameras had been sabotaged in the morning. Wires were pulled out. Some cameras were broken. This phenomenon was so hyper pervasive, it simply did not want to give them any opportunity of recording itself. This went on for a considerable length of time. It's very frustrating. Occasionally, they might just get the odd thing that picked up on CCTV, which was profound. Sometimes there was visions on the CCTV camera of things that only lasted 10 to 15 seconds, but it was so profound they couldn't explain them. One of which would be, as an example, around about 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, the CCTV infrared cameras pointed out in the distant fields suddenly something manifests in the distance as large as a huge building and then fades out only to leave an imprint in the ground the following day large imprints in the dry ground these are heavy heavy items and some of these things would would, would literally press into the ground a foot or so these imprints and it just couldn't understand the most profound paranormal things were reported as people were visiting the location as the even the owner himself had a profound many profound experiences one of which he was in the field with his son one day looking and checking over the his stock his cattle because they were being found mutilated they were being found disappeared and uh, some horrific incidents happen and it, and it happens sometimes within minutes in on occasions even within seconds incidents were happening and they could never ever saw the the culprit the per, the people or thing behind this you know who was ever responsible but as they were walking through this field one day suddenly their conversation broke between him and his son and was interrupted by another conversation another conversation that was coming from above him and his son about 12 feet up in the air and yet when they looked up they could see nothing but they stood in this one part of the field listening to this conversation between what they could only assume is two male people talking english having a having a, a, a quite a deep conversation and it was very frustrating to him and, he, and in fact what he did he shouted up to the sky we can hear you and at that point, there was dead silence, as if shock had befallen whatever this thing was that maybe they didn't expect they could be heard. And then there was giggles. There was some laughter. And, and then the conversation carried on. And there was no explanation for how this phenomenon was happening and where it was coming from and what it even consisted of. Is it another reality? People have talked about other realities and other port and portals and all sorts of things. There was certainly light phenomena that's been taking place at Skinwalker Ranch. Objects have certainly seen, been seen to coming through them. There has even been reports of rings of light and looking through them, it looks like they're looking at a different location. Even figures have been seen to be coming through these and scurrying off into the darkness. Some of these figures very large. Cryptid sightings of strange creatures, paranormal events like poltergeist infestation in the ranch itself taking place. Whilst these light, strange light phenomena is happening on microscopic scales inside the house and large scale outside as, a, as an unidentified object. The phenomena, it was going on for a long time. The Native Americans, we've talked to people, they said this phenomena has been going on in that location for hundreds upon hundreds of years. The great grandfathers used to talk about that location. It's a very spiritual location where they did believe that, you know, things could come through from another reality there. And that 
this ranch is now there and occupies that land, yet the phenomena continues. Now, it went very quiet for a duration of time. Skinwalker Ranch, after Bigelow, uh, had uh, Robert Bigelow from um, uh, being involved with NIDS at the time, spent a number of years there, highly secure location, conducted as much research as he possibly could, and then, of course, sold the ranch. In more recent times, the ranch has been, re- uh, has been repurchased and uh, new security and ongoing further research is taking place there at this very moment in time. We believe, and from what we have been told, that the phenomenon is absolutely strife again in that location and that they are, tr- they are trying to apply new forms of science, uh, utilising new forms of technology, advanced equipment, to try and gather as much data as possible. New research is, is ongoing. Some of that data is actually, I believe, being overlooked by a famous researcher, uh, Dr Jacques Vallée from France. He was a quite a prolific author in the subjects of ufology. And he's overlooking a lot of this, um, this phenomena. And those, those, tra- those attributes are not only witnessed and seen in the vicinity of Skinwalker Ranch, it also takes place with general public, you know, in, in, in and around the world, at different places, at different times, where there's these connections between the poltergeist or the paranormal phenomena and the ufological. So some of the most recent research that we did, um, we decided to formulate a new project. And it was a scientific survey initially first to find out how many UFOs are actually seen around the world. I mean, this is we're in the 21st century now. We should be able to get some statistics from numerous different countries that will recognize this phenomenon as it, for what it is. And, uh, and so on, keep statistics and, all, and put all this together. Let's have a look. Uh, how many real UFOs are actually seen? Well, the, po- the first problem is, is that we have to take into consideration some of those UFOs might be misidentifications. It happens. Um, but at the same time, we also have to say the results are very conservative that we may not be getting all the data being reported to us. Certainly now, I mean, most people really have sightings and experiences. And usually the first thing is that they pop up on on the internet, on a social network, social media. uh, And usually the story dies after, after a week or so, or not often does it land on the desks of many UFO organizations and establishments that, that do the number crunching, that do keep statistics and data. Uh, and that's unfortunate because it's very difficult to accumulate that information. But never, nonetheless, we did manage to, on the basis of of the countries that uh, uh, statistics we obtain, a calculation came forward of a UFO was reported officially to somebody every eight seconds of the day and night. Every eight seconds. Now, calculating that up, we'd have to say that's a considerable a huge, considerable amount of UFOs are being seen around the world in any given time. And if that is the case, we really, really seriously need to ask, where are they coming from? Because that's a lot of objects. There's a lot of things that are being seen. And I've spent the last 37 years in this subject, and I'm always hearing reports. I'm always seeing people report things over the internet, be it photograph, a strange video, things in the paper, things you see on television. It's a constant, constant thing. People have said to me many times, the subject of ufology has died. It's not being reported anymore. They're not, the incidents aren't happening. I say, no, that's absolutely not true. From what I can gather, the incidents are still taking place but the reporting of them has certainly lulled because there has been certain places where people could officially report them in the uk where at one time we had the ministry of defense government governmental body which would uh, which would take your call if you wanted to report a ufo officially and the documentation would be held by the government on that sighting and they closed their doors to the public the public didn't had a, lost an outlet of where to report forcing people to rely upon more of the internet to report their incidents. And most of them are really just kind of putting them up on social media rather than reporting into really organizations where that really is important for those statistics to be be put into a database and calculated because surveys are carried out yearly to find out, you know, what South societies are happening and where those incidents are happening. Because sometimes data will tell us information to help us conduct further research and certainly answer a number of, of, of important questions. So what we realized very quickly is that if we're having so many objects being seen around the world, where are they coming from? Well, we did talk with astronomers from 
SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And it was quite an interesting response that he actually gave us. They said that space is unusually quiet, unusually quiet. And that was an interesting comment because the second question to them is like, well, you know, the, if people perceive to be seeing unidentified or aerial phenomena and they are traversing from space to Earth and, it, and this is an amount of UFOs being seen, where would they be coming from? Well, their response was, well, well they're not really into UFOs. <laughs> they're into, into signals. However, if you try and force the issue, they say, well, we can certainly say if there was a super highway because it'd have to be a super highway for the amount of objects statistically being seen around the planet traveling to Earth and back, then we'd know, we'd see it, and it would make noise. It traffic makes electronic noise. We'd be able to detect it, and we're not. So we have to ask the question, where are these things coming from? And that led us into a whole new paradigm of research known as Project Doorway, because we wanted to look where phenomena is taking place, the most significant incidents around the world are where they've taken place. And is there any correlations? Why? Why are they taking place in the locations they are? And three years ago, we came across a correlation between what we refer to as positive magnetic anomalies and locations of high strangeness. Well, now, I say high strangeness for a reason, because it does constitute not just UFOs, but high concentrations of paranormal activity, high concentrations of cryptid sightings, strange creatures, even Bigfoot sightings. And of course, probably the most concerning, concentrations of disappearances. And I don't mean just average disappearances, I mean profound disappearances. Now, there is a number of documents out, uh, out there in the world. Uh, there's also a series of books by, done by um, um, David Pilates in regarding uh, the missing 411. <clears throat> uh, that number now is obsolete because we are far from 411. And I'm sure David would agree with me when I say that, that these places, and David does know this, that uh, these places have certainly positive magnetic anomalies, very, very potent positive magnetic anomalies. Now, for the viewers out there listening, <clears throat> uh, sorry, listeners out there, what a positive magnetic anomaly is, it's very easy. And you can do the research yourself. There's a number of satellites in orbit going around Earth, and we have access through that, uh, through the filters of the satellite systems applying to Google Earth. Most people, most of our listeners will know what Google Earth is. It's a piece of software that allows you to uh, monitor the Earth from uh, satellite photography. And it's a regular thing that's been updated. There's always new photographs. When you look for certain filters from other satellites to be applied to Google Earth, there are a number, there's quite a number of them, but the two most significant ones are the uh, Earth Magnetic Anomaly Grid, and the second is a Geomagnetic Anomaly Grid. And it applies filters to the, the overall maps. And you can locate where these positive magnetics lie because they are... Um, they're kindly, they've coloured them for us. Um, they are measured in a Tesla range and they uh, are vary from different colours. The negative magnetic anomalies from dark blue, but as they go into the pink and the purple and the dark purple, they become very high positive magnetic anomalies. When you look and apply these filters and then you apply the grid of incidents that have taken place around the world the most significant you you can pick them up you can pick out the the travis walton incident the uh, from the forest where he was uh, allegedly abducted you can pick the uh, the strange creatures that seen in kentucky and hopkinsville and you can go through and we went through thousands not hundreds but thousands of these right from the you know from the 1950s uh, giant rock incident out into, in the deserts to the the most significant um, more current uh, incidents that are taking place. And we found a, a ridiculously amount of these are falling in the, the positive magnetic anomalies. And we thought, statistically speaking, we should have had at least a 60, 40, a 50, 50, a 40, 60. But no, well, the more research we did, the more and more we found there was a connection. So we started digging and we started talking to people and conducting research around the world. And we got data from people which 
mentioned positive magnetic anomalies. Now, at that time, people really weren't talking about these, didn't really know what they were. People didn't really get into it too much. It was just thought it was a geological type stuff. Um, but the more we researched, the more we started finding. In fact, Philip Corso, um, who wrote that famous book, A Day After Roswell, who's no longer with us, who was a military officer, and claimed to have been involved in the Roswell craft and back engineering. And in his famous book, he talks about the discovery of, um, of fiber optics and information traveling across these fiber optics at the speed of light. Well, we, t we do take it for Burton that, okay, we all know what fiber optics are, but do we really truly know where they came from? And is, was he telling the truth? And it was absolutely fascinating book. But he did say something which was very interesting before he died. And now in 1982, whilst he had still had knowledge of what was going on um, at high levels in the military and the government, he stated publicly on several occasions that the US government at that time in 1982, were scientifically researching and investigating seven major positive magnetic anomalies in association with UFO activity. And the data that was obtained from these research would suggest that these locations are being utilized by the phenomena. They're coming in, they're going out. They might be traversing around, but they seem to come in and go out at certain locations. People are even in those residential areas in where positive magnetics lies. They have actually even claimed that they've seen just the man sudden manifestations of objects. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they just disappear, fade out, they're gone, they come. And it's a regular occurrence. And people have been reporting this for 30, 40 years. You talk to people and say, oh yeah, we see them all the time. And yet other people are astonished to hear that sort of thing. But when you go to these locations, People will show you where this phenomenon is and you can actually see this for yourself. And myself and a number of other researchers have visited now a, a huge amount of positive magnetic anomalies around the world uh, from South America and Ireland and uh, Northern America and, and throughout Europe. And uh, we're, very, we're heading off to Malta in September to conduct more research there regarding their positive magnetic anomalies in association with this phenomena. And... We have witnessed this phenomenon. We have seen the phenomenon, this phenomenon manifest. Now, the only way I can describe this was is that on location, a craft of source materializes. And it's, a, it's, 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 a lar it's very large. It's larger than an aircraft I've ever seen. And the lights on it are, up, are the most bright, vivid lights I've ever seen. And I can only describe them as like an Arca's light, Arca's weld light, that that bright white red and in some cases we have the orange amber ones turn up these there's been a nickname for these we call them amber gamblers a few people are all the researchers have been calling them that these amber gamblers that's associated to a lot of northern america uh, incidents and uh, we have photographs and videos of these things in arizona uh, this year last year the year before the continued phenomena however these these types of phenomena is also been seen in uh, at Skinwalker Ranch during the mutilations uh, incidents of, of animals, and they are also in connection to other incidents around the world of animal mutilations, um, missing time incidents, uh, and generally strange, profound uh, experiences that people in those localities have had over a duration of years. So they seem to be a varied type of phenomena. But when these things manifest, they seem to just switch on as if they were always there, but you would never see them. And then they switch on, spank, there it is. And we've seen this on countless occasions in these locations. And what's very interesting, we wanted to know why, what is going on? What is it about positive magnetic anomalies? Um, are they, do portals really exist? Because the word to us, from a scientific stance, the word sounds very sci-fi. A portal. It sounds something from fantasy films or sci-fi films, and surely these things don't really exist. However, recent information gathered from three years ago onwards now is uh, talks of a NASA mission, and there's data out there on this mission from NASA, and it's known as the MMS mission. We launched four satellites into uh, into space, and between us and the sun, they found 
and this is NASA's own words, they found portals, long sustained portals, with some of them very small, some of them very vast, and they were investigating them. Now they've had, they've fitted a, a fancy name to these now. They're known as electron diffusion regions, uh, but they are positive magnetic anomalies, and uh, they're reason, obviously researching these for a reason. Rumor has it, and I haven't been able to verify this for obvious reasons, but rumor has it on a uh, coming from people who I trust. I've said that uh, one of those MMS satellites has actually been put through one of these areas, portals, electron diffusion regions, and uh, and instantly vanished, and appeared some time later, millions of miles away, in very close to the sun. In fact, uh, the signals came back, uh, and if that is the case, and if that is true. We haven't been able to verify that for obvious reasons because we, use, <laughs> no one's going to verify that, obviously. But we, we can't see anything across the MMS mission. But what we can say is that this scientific team has sent four identical satellites up to look at these, uh, these particular fields, these anomalies. Isn't it, isn't it a normal thinking process that you probably would send one of these satellites in there just to, just to see what happens? Well, yeah, I would. If I was a scientist, I've got my data. I know they're there. I know they exist. I've got four of these identical satellites. Of course, I'm going to send one in. And it is very, the you know, it's very theoretical that yes, it, it could have done so. If those are the results, then we really do have to question. You know, are these things around in plentiful? And is the phenomenon utilising? Because how else are they getting here? We just simply don't know. This what does this phenomenon represent? If it's interdimensional, where are they coming from? Though that. Many people claim to have had experiences and uh, and seen many entities. Our project looked at those closely and we realized very quickly that the amount of reported types of entities, creatures, call them what you will, are over 6,000 varied types now. 6,000 significant varied types of entities. Could there really be over 6,000 different types? Could they all be coming from hundreds and hundreds of different planets? Well, to me, it sounds a bit more like uh, a sci-fi series, like Star Trek or something. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it sounds just very sci-fi to me. Or are we dealing with a singular phenomena that has many masks? We do know when we trade back in time that the fairy counters, gentry counters of Ireland, depicted them as different beings, but we're doing exactly the same thing. In Dublin, in Ireland, the, the head office there, the governmental office and the town hall have decided to release official old documentation of UFO encounters. And when you go and read these from the 11th and 12th and 13th century, people are reporting flying trains and, some, and small beings descending into forts and, and rivers only to disappear beneath the water and head off out of sight and never to be seen again. Now that reminds me very much similar to a spate of incidents that took place in the 1940s known as the ghost rocket era. And there were places like Sweden and Switzerland and numerous other places where these objects were cylindrical, train-like looking objects with portals along the side plummeting down from the sky like a hailing rocket, only to slow down and hover over lakes and rivers and slowly de descend upon them. Local residents would hear the hissing sound as if steam was coming off, as if something hot had touched the water. And then they slowly watched as it disappeared beneath the waves, never to be seen. And in fact, military were called on several occasions to, to, to literally dredge the rivers and lakes looking for these objects. They never once found anything. It's as if these objects went under the water and out of sight, uh, maybe traveled somewhere else. That's not the first time we've heard about UFOs traveling underwater. USOs is a very common thing. Um, we have recently seen a lot of 
things circulating a television show known as Unidentified, which has its associations, its ground associations with the to the, Scar, to the Stars Academy, the TTSA. And I've had some involvement with the TTSA from the early days, and uh, I'm certainly aware of some of their research in Project, Project Adam of metamaterial analysis uh, and other things which are not public as yet, but are, will be public soon. And it's very interesting when you're looking at the reports of what they're actually saying, that these objects traverse in three different ways, be it underwater, in the air, and probably even in zero gravity locations, such as near orbit of Earth uh, and places like that. So they have these strange craft that can outfly military pilot Hornet, Hornet jets very easily in specific locations around the Earth and nobody seems to know who they are or what they are consist of. One thing is for sure that they seem to be able to have the, certainly the capabilities of flying at tremendous speed. Where I believe there was a video that was released known as the gimbal video where this object was filmed by forward infra infrared looking cameras on the Hornet jets and they were filming this traveling at quarter the speed of sound. They do instant maneuvers. They can turn on a penny. They can tape sharp corners. They, the inertia effects of whoever the real UFO experts are, and that's those that are inside these things, whoever or whatever they are, they're not feeling the inertia. So we're talking of different types of physics that's involved with these types of craft. And of course, as you push forward more into research, we come across interesting things such as a couple of years ago, we found a patent that was passed by the United States government, uh, Navy associated, in regarding something that was referred to as a hybrid aerospace underwater craft. Hybrid aerospace underwater craft. In other words, this was a craft that had the capabilities of traversing those three areas, the water, the air and zero gravity. And this patent was passed in December of 2018 and signed off. The information within that patent is, is fascinating. They talk about a technology, um, utilized a technology that creates a bubble, a, literally a bubble around these crafts uh, and alters the space and time. So they don't, there's no inertia. And it talks a little bit about the information that's used to build these these materials and these these exotic advanced technologies and how they're implemented into these craft and used. Now, many people will say who have worked for these big companies, the corporate companies in aircraft, secret aircraft manufacture, or even government programs, will say that if a patent has been put forward, it means they've already got it. They've already have it because that point is then, yes, it works. Yes, we've got it. Now we need to protect it as opposed to coming out in the early stages and saying, oh, God, this is what we're going to try and build. It just would seem more feasible thing to do. And I, I agree with these professionals when they say that's the process of how that would work. I, I would totally agree. That's probably what I would do uh, due simply for its protection of the painting. We have to look now. We have to seriously put the dots together and say, OK, Yes, we are truly dealing with some profound phenomena here, an aerial phenomena. And we also probably are dealing with advanced technology. It's, fl it's flying in our skies, which are masqueraded under the headline of UFOs, unidentified flying objects. And I don't believe the governments or the people responsible for this, the departments that are certainly compartmentalized, care about that. I think they're quite happy to have someone say, oh, I, it was a UFO, because it certainly takes the blame away from them. It's not in a secret exotic craft. There's, it takes, it eliminates the problem straight away. And I think they're quite happy to do that. So I think we are dealing with two different types of phenomena. And this has been going on for a long, long time. I think we've had this technology for probably 20, 30, 40, if not 40 years, if not more, maybe on some of this sort of technology. I'm certainly aware that certain technologies existed within the secret realm of, uh, of advanced technology 28 years ago. Because when I was working for NATO 28 years ago, I was involved in communications, uh, two official secrets that signed for United uh, for United Kingdom, secret technology, 
in regarding telecommunications with satellites, three very large unlisted satellites in orbit, which are still unlisted, probably owned by um, the governments of the world. That the use of bio boards were used. Let me explain what a bio board is. Imagine looking at a computer, a PC, and the PC motherboard. On these motherboards were biological circuits which were designed for memory, designed to look after themselves, self-heal, self-maintain. They were intelligent. And these were automated, controlled and switched on by satellites. And this was a project that Marconi was involved in 28 years ago when I was installing these amazing boards, which were nicknamed bio boards, coincidentally. Um, we had used to always have a joke between the, the guys we were working about with this. But it was secret. The, the, it wasn't technology that we were supposed to talk about. And the only reason why I talk about it is that four years ago, IBM announced officially across the internet to the world, they are going to be introducing biological circuits uh, and biological plasma memories, cells to electronic boards, and computer boards. And the cat was out the back. I thought, well, if IBM are talking about it now, then I, I don't have a problem being able to say what I was involved in back when I was working for NATO 28 years ago in, in RAF Weatherfields in Essex. There is technology out there. There's the amazing, and that's, I, I was just a telecommunication guy. I'm nothing special. I was no high ranking officer or anything like that. It was just my job. I was just an engineer and I was doing my job and I, and I had to know that to do that job. But I had to consider what what is really out there at the real top end of this. Uh, the secrecy, the technology. And I, I'd be very surprised if we don't have the capabilities of things that do fly and act like UFOs now. So we, we, it's kind of a double-edged sword here when we research and investigate because yes, we do believe there's a true phenomena. And yes, we do believe there's uh, advanced technology as well. And the biggest problem for us is that uh, is differentiating the two. Now, People have talked for many years about Area 51. That's the biggest place. There's been a lot of talk over the internet really recently about hundreds of thousands of people are going to storm Area 51. And I've had a good laugh about that, Andrew, to be on about it. Because I thought, well, you know, it's just a joke. But it's getting a bit out of hand because the United States Air Force have had to do an official release now and say, do not come near Area 51. <laughs> As if 100,000 people are going to storm. I'd love it. It'd be interesting. It'd certainly be interesting to actually want to see what happens there. But uh, I don't believe really anything's going on at Area 51. It's too vulnerable now and it's been vulnerable for many many years what i do think is that off the coast of mexico just as the ttsa joined this tv show known as the unidentified which is believed is screening in the in the us is screening in the uk at the moment they've been looking at the incidents that have been taking place in a region of the sea off the coast of mexico uh, and san diego and those areas where the nimitz the USS Nimitz and other ships have had and are continuing to have their training sessions in that location. First off, it's a no-fly zone, no, no civilian aircraft. Secondly, it's really a no-ship zone. There isn't many, you know, there's, it's very sanctioned there because of these tests, these uh, operations that regularly take place by the United States Navy uh, and Air Force. And what's very interesting is, is that it's 150 miles out I'm sure. So you're not, you, you can't see it from land. You, the most you're going to see is about 26 miles, maybe 30 miles at elevation before the curvature of the earth and you lose sight of anything out there. Um, 150 miles out in an area where nobody's going to see anything. No one is going to see anything out there. And I believe that could be a new testing ground. And I believe that they are playing with some wonderful toys out there. Now, when the Nimitz comes along and the pilots, you know, are flying out there, and they see these things, they're going to report them as unidentified objects. They don't know. They're, they're thinking, what the hell are these things? And of course, they go back and they report them and that. But what you will consistently find is no one really cares. The captains, the generals, they wipe the information. They don't log the information. When pressed about the information, they say, oh, it doesn't matter. They laugh about it. They don't even tell the pilots and officers not to even talk about it because when you turn around and say do not talk about this then there's something to it 
they're even letting them talk about it because it dis it gets rid of it it's it's just an a silly nonsense citing it means nothing well it that's couldn't be further from the truth to be honest with you but it's being treated that way for a reason and we believe believe the reason for that is simply because somewhere along that line up that chain someone knows they're likely to be our own or belong to the united states some high-tech program test flights perfect location it could be a new area 51 in the sense of speaking especially if these craft can go underwater and certainly they seem to be because pilots from the nimitz flying hornets saw one of these objects in the water radar picked up on these objects in the water traveling at tremendous speeds four or five times any nuclear submarine can travel and they don't know what these things are so we always have to question could that be the new fly zone could that be it's certainly a fantastic location because it's certainly out of anybody's eye, eyesight so because any place now really you know with uh, with people being able to travel people can get to see things just like area 51 and of course it's not so much secret really anymore it's kind of old news now so yes there probably are testing things out there and many other locations when i visited the the british aerospace in the uk which are responsible they, i mean back in the day they were responsible for testing and manufacturing this the fa117 stealth fighter engines and in fact local residents that live by used to hear this tremendous noise during the night as they were testing them from the british aerospace hangars and it was secret all of it was secret. In fact, we didn't really even see the stealth fighter until 1991 during the Gulf War. And when it was on television and information, everybody went, wow, flipping. <laughs> the United States Air Force got some really new toys here. That's that's amazing. I've never seen anything like it. Have you seen the shape of this aircraft? Have you seen how fast it is? It's, um, um, and it's, it's, it's like something it's alien because it can't even really be picked up very well on radar. It's as if it's invisible and it was all wonderful but how much have we digested that it's kind of common knowledge now we kind of go oh yeah we know that you know it's all it's old news um what's the latest toys we have that's what i want to know considering the stealth fighter was manufactured around about from what i believe around about 1973 i know i have a book on lockheed and the photograph in there was from 1974 showing a stealth fighter and yet it didn't show up on our screens until 1991. Well, we have to question, where did they test fly these? And were they misidentified as, as UFOs at that time? And where's the latest generation of toys? Because if the SR-71 and the FAA, the stealth fighter and the stealth bomber are old, then where's all the new good stuff? Where's all the good stuff? You know, and it's got to be out there. And it's certainly, I don't think it's out Area 51 for sure. Um, but we do, and we are left with a problem. So what we decided to do with, with Project Doorway is that we wanted to go back in time because if this is the true phenomena, we have to draw a line somewhere and say, OK, we simply did not have the technology. It can't be a misidentification for something that we've got because we could not have had that technology 100 years ago, for an example. A thousand years ago, if you want to make some mention of that, we could not have. And people yet yeah, reported these things. They were well documented in, in scriptures and documents and, uh, and, and, and literally old, old, old writings from around the world. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of reported incidents that match current UFO sightings. Now, what's very interesting is that it doesn't seem like this phenomenon has changed much. It hasn't grown. It doesn't seem to have produced bigger and better or certainly significantly different types of phenomena. Things of strange craft like dish-shaped objects have been seen, triangular, to, uh, cylindrical objects. They have been reported and seen for hundreds of thousands of years, right back to the very beginnings. Uh, and probably initially thought to be something of a religious connotation through uh, paintings and tapestries and artwork. We see from the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th century that certainly people who were creating these, these artists, thought at that time that there was a religious connotation to these, a, be it a connection to the Bible, a connection to uh, the crucifixion of Christ, connection to uh, uh, the Mother Mary, and, and, and so on and so forth. There are hundreds and thousands of examples out there. We've got some in our own museums here. You know, the Annunciation, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's amazing painting. We've, and it's it's about the, the, the crucifixion of Christ. But when you actually start looking at these uh, these paintings, you start to see these objects, and they're purposely, meaningfully 
put into the, these paintings. And we don't know why. Maybe that these things were seen. Maybe that they thought they were godly. Somehow they connected with spiritual people. And uh, so we wanted to know how long really can we go back before we can draw a line and say, okay, it can't be ours. It's not our technology. It's got to be the phenomena. And we, we, we worked out a rough time, and, but we went further and further back. And the more we went back, the more we found, you know, in, in, in old scriptures, we made scriptures from India. And, uh, and they, they are tremendous in regard, very rich in, in, in unidentified. And they are not just very rich in, in information about UFOs, but also about the technicalities, how they actually maybe even worked and, and what they could do with these things and how they operated. And it's, it's you think, where on earth does that information come from? Well, it's, you know, it's not isolated. It's certainly not just India. Many other places around the world do exactly the same thing um, and have these scriptures and old documents. So we have to question, it's a phenomenon that's probably been with us as long as we can remember. Uh, but it has seemed to have been given different names and uh, and referenced in different ways. But when you look truly at what it represents, we seem to be looking at the same thing over and over again. But one of the biggest mysteries of all which we found was something quite profound, which was this evasion to iron. Now, it sounds quite, <laughs> it is very profound. But the more we studied it, the more it seemed to be known by our ancestors that the paranormal and not just paranormal strange lights that came down in the sky abducted animals or mutilated animals or abducted children or people with missing time uh, or paranormal encounters they were kind of all considered one thing and people and we do not know where this we're still trying to find out how far this goes back because we're trying to find the source of this information how did they know People started using iron, raw iron, to cause the phenomena, to keep the phenomena at bay. And I don't mean just paranormal phenomena, I mean ufological phenomena. If you study the records, UFO records from Ireland and animal mutilations, and yes, they are still happening plentifully. Animal mutilations are also happening all, all over the world in, and Ireland. And, uh, and the, the, I think it was only about three and a half weeks ago, there was a last reported incident uh, that I'm aware of um, in taking place. So yes, they are still happening and in association with strange light phenomena. But hundreds of years ago, the farmers were basically driving iron rods into the ground around their fields to protect their animals. I don't know how or where that information how how they knew that would work and where it derived but it seemed to work it, it stopped it kept seemed to keep the phenomena at bay and the incidents which were taking place sometimes every two or three weeks at a particular farm suddenly ceased uh, and it kind of got passed on and people passed this knowledge on and talked to other people and this was kind of a growing thing but that and when you go further back, you find that there were other connections with iron. In the Middle East and other places like uh, like that in Mesopotamia, the people were using hematite as a protection against the jinn and th things like that. Now, jinn is many different references, the daemons and demons, and, uh, and it's just a long list of names associated to the same type of entity. Uh, certainly paranormally orientated, but they believe they could be protected through hematite. Now, hematite is a, it's a stone which a, a very high percentage, if around about 90% of this, is probably made of iron, um, which is interesting. To ward away strange paranormal occurrences, people around the world started putting iron up around their doorways, nails around fl in floorboards, things across thresholds of doorways. Um, we when I talked with research, a very well known researcher, Rosemary Ellen Gooley, who's a prolific author in the subjects of the paranormal, she's been researching paranormal supernatural phenomena for a very long time. She's got hundreds and hundreds of accounts of people that 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 cause the phenomena to to evade or diminish, disappear, simply because they introduced iron to the environment. People with night terrors or being plagued by visits, visitations in the bedrooms, iron nails were placed into the floorboards around beds and things, and it did seem to work. Even the whole concept of iron, the iron 
lucky horseshoe. When you actually really research that, it was nothing about luck. It was simply because it was iron. And it was an easy way to get hold of it because it was spent horseshoes. And they were plentiful many days ago, as you can well imagine. And they used them to ward away bad phenomena, um, paranormal incidents. People placed them above the doors and all on the floors. And, and this is a, a, growing, a growing occurrence. When you go back even further, you get into Egyptian times, you read documentation, uh, information from hypothetical texting that even Tutankhamun, wanted to protect himself and not just protect himself but battle be able to battle not just the living but also from the underworld from the dead from the other side from the other reality so he had forged a very very special weapon and that weapon was made of the purest iron that anybody's ever found on planet earth and then and they couldn't find it they took samples of this to Carmen's dagger very well known you can research this over the internet and they found that it was so profound, the iron, that it didn't even come from planet Earth. It actually came from meteorite. And this meteorite was forged in because of this unique iron forged into this wonderful dagger of the Tutankhamun to not only protect himself, but also be able to fight within both sides of reality. Because they really did believe the Egyptians about, they, they spent all life basically thinking about death, to be honest with you, to put it short. They had a fascination. They had knowledge. And we have to question our ancients. How did they have this knowledge? Where was it coming from? Recent tests that we've carried out in Project Doorway means visiting several ancient sites all around the world, active, what we believe are active sites where UFO or aerial phenomena is in association to these locations and still very uh, still happening. And people are reporting these incidents. We visited these locations and what do we find? Well, we find very specific ancient buildings which are aligned to the rising and the setting sun, be it the equinox or the solstice. And we also find that these locations, uh, a lot of them are built as resonant chambers. They resonate a certain sound. If we talk about the hypogeum in Malta, it's, it, it's purely underground and it's a tremendous feat of how they actually managed to build this. It's still mostly unknown to science. We cannot find out. We do not know how they managed to do this. But nevertheless, one of those chambers is acutely uh, attuned to 110 hertz. And what science has found that when producing a, a vocal 110 hertz in the chamber, it is designed to amplify that sound and focus it to the central point of the chamber. And when somebody is sat at the focal center, of that chamber under 110 hertz vocal frequency that their internal and external wounds heal six times faster than scientific evidence that they actually heal six times faster how did they know that was it a treatment room of ancient treatment it's like going to an ancient doctor's and andrews it doesn't really make much sense but that's the only best way to describe it and these are not just uh in, in Malta, all over the world, in, in, in New Grange, in, in Ireland, there's an ancient, an ancient building there, a mount. And when you go in there, it's attuned to 111 hertz, does a very similar thing, but it actually, in this case, just that slight shift in the attuning, what that does is it, um, it, it kind of reverses you from your right side brain thinking to your left side braining, brain thinking, and it opens up a whole new thought process and it's also supposed to be good for healing process of DNA. And is this a new information now? It's coming forward that shows evidence of these profound frequencies and the effects on, on the human, on the human being and subtle electrical fields. Also, it's, it's quite profound how we how we actually are tuned to them. We are somehow connected to these ancient ways of life. And our ancestors certainly had a certain lot of knowledge, but what, what happened many years ago, and which we've discovered all around the world, is that somehow they knew of this, of this aerial phenomena. Many ancient civilizations talked of sky gods and descending from the sky. And, but when you really do your research, what you find is, is that they seem to have been, through a certain amount of time, all around the planet, ancient civilizations were worshipping serpents, the serpent gods. And more and more information is coming out, such as 
um, the Mayans and the and the and the Aztecs even possibly even didn't actually even create some of their buildings that they may have just occupied them they may have found them but one thing is for sure that they were worshipping serpents the serpent gods they were even sacrificing to them they were even offering of gold and jewelry to these to these serpent gods whatever these things were but they were by all intents and purpose from all the information gathered around the world these things were coming through from somewhere else and we have to ask the question why are these locations in positive magnetic anomalies just as the ufo phenomena appearance it is very interesting it's cutting pretty cutting edge stuff some of the new research is coming forward especially the metamaterial analysis coming from project adam a part of the ttsa though that there is a lot more information to come forward soon which is going to be given out to the public i will actually give some bits of information uh, and some of that is from the conclusions and research carried out on ob on materials metal type materials which have been said to have fallen from uh, UFOs or in a, on, on a number of occasions even uh, retrieved from a crashed retrieval site uh, there's several pieces of those what's very interesting when you look at these materials under microscopy which is the uh, it's a very high powered form of uh, microscopes it's quite wondrous to see how these interconnecting layers actually work I mean, they're made from materials we all find on Earth, bismuth and, uh, uh, and many other different types of elements that we see, uh, which we've found on planet Earth. It's not, it's not an extraterrestrial substance. But what is interesting is that through the manufacture of these metals, the isotopic levels change in the metals, which means, as an example, if we go and dig up the metal bismuth, out of the ground somewhere on our planet it will have an isotopic level so as, as an example say 4.6 to 6.2 and that'll be the same for all over the planet it's our signature for planet earth but what we see is that yes bismuth has been used and yes bismuth is available here on, on our planet we can dig it up but through the process of manufacture, the isotopic levels have changed. They are reading something like 7.3 to 8.4 as an example, which shows that A is rather non-terrestrial or the process of manufacture changes the isotopic level in the metamaterials. And we believe that's what's happening. And the, when looking on a microscope, you can see layers and layers of differing types of metal used and it's used for a purpose it's used because it creates a, a superconductor at the end of the day so what they're realizing these layers are actually manufactured purposely as if the best way to describe it is 3d printed now we are actually doing 3d printing we're into it Duke University here in the UK does it uh, and they are applying terahertz frequency light to it and it's they're doing wondrous things they're losing weight they're producing resonant frequencies and the bending light around them. They're amazing things, these superconductive metals. And this is probably, we're already probably dealing with this uh, in, a, in, in, in a military sense of, uh, of advanced technology. But some of these pieces of material are 50, 60 years old and been kept until the advancements in science have caught up to be able to thoroughly examine them. And now they're being taken out of the archives and now they're being examined and now they're finding from 29 to 80 odd different types of layers of these varied metals which produce semiconductive uh, reactions and what's very interesting is that they went to one one further and applied light frequencies to the metamaterials and when they applied a light frequency within the i can't give the figures but a light frequency within the terahertz frequency range I'll give you a clue here. The terahertz, the terahertz frequency range lies within, we see it within sunset and sunrise. There's a bit of a clue here that that particular material starts to lose its value in weight very, very quickly to the point where it fine tunes the terahertz frequency to a resonant frequency. It's generated from the piece of metal as it's slightly hovering as an anti-gravity piece of device. It's actually hovering off 
the table when a certain light frequency is hitting it. And not only that, it's resonating a certain frequency. Uh, a, a, you can actually hear a vocal frequency. What that basically means is, is that we now have to look at new areas of research in superconductivity and terahertz. And what is it that's going on here? Now, that's interesting because last the last couple of months, we've been looking at the reports coming from a place called Hasdalen in Norway. Um, this is a place where they've had strange light phenomena for many, many years. In fact, there's a scientific establishment and a laboratory up there on top of this hill looking over Hasdalen Valley where these lights are commonly seen to travel down. And they, they are intelligent. They're not just of some random light. There are people that have suggested that, oh, it's just some type of light phenomenon. It's a, it's a natural earth light or plasma conditioned light, but no, absolutely not. We have seen, we know that these take evasive maneuvers. They disappear when planes are flying over and they come back on when they disappear. This is not a random natural geological uh, anomaly. This is something else. And apart from that, the lights, are also those strange amber gambler colours, those strange amber colours, which people have referred to as amber gamblers around the world. I've seen these things and recorded them in Arizona. They're no different than they are in Norway. Exactly the same phenomena. Oh, and just to top the list, there is paranormal activities, there's cryptid sightings, and there are mutilations in the same area. It's not pure by chance, this. But what is interesting, in 2007, using diffraction grating uh, technology of cameras. They have specialised cameras up there at this laboratory and they've been filming and photographing these for many, many years. But applying this new technology, they can break down what the type of light source that these things are producing. And as these amber coloured lights or craft fly over, sometimes in formation, sometimes splitting into two, sometimes changing rapidly or speeding up, that they are producing a light frequency within that very same terahertz frequency, exactly the same. So are we looking at here the true phenomena? And is that light frequency generated to help that craft perform what it needs to perform? be it a superconductivity, be it that the possibility of invisibility. The, the, and of course, it's all ties in with frequencies. And we do know that this phenomenon does emit an infrasound, even though we're not hearing it. They are emitting an infrasound. This is why animals fall quiet, insects fall quiet, birds fall quiet at specific times of these incidents because they can generate an infrasound. And just as crickets hear it, we tested this in Arkansas last year. When we walk out into the field and suddenly the crickets stop because the, those vi micro vibrations as you're brushing past uh, reeds and grasses, they generate an infrasound and they see it as a warning signal and fall quiet. And this is exactly the same process. The phenomena must be generating an infrasound and affecting its environment. And that people have reported that strange, eerie, profound silence just before the incident, sometimes even just before a manifestation of, the, of an object. And they cannot understand, well, that's possibly of what is actually taking place. So what we're actually doing, Andrew, is we're trying to press forward more and more and more into the real 21st century looking at this phenomena by breaking down all the all the all the segregating panels that stopped us before from looking into that other study about the paranormal i mean why should we have in the power is a perfect example which people didn't really connect in many years ago in 1977 an incident took place a, a specialized project took place in, in ontario in canada using uh, with parapsychologists and, and doctors and professors and it was known as the Philip experiment some people or some of our listeners may have heard about this it was an experiment to see can we manufacture a ghost through the power of belief well it is feasible because the power of belief is a wonderful powerful thing I mean in fact you know people which are devout Catholics um, will have stigmata stigmata appears on them simply through the power of strong belief we know that can happen you know these, these placebos work as well so we know that the power of belief is very very powerful and can change and can bring something manifest something into real 
world, the real 3D living world as we see it, such as the wounds of Christ appearing on people, the sudden manifestation of these wounds. It's a physical phenomena taking place through the power of belief. It's conjured. It's a conjured concept. Can it be done in any way? Well, other ways? Well, yes. It would seem that the evidence for the Philippe experiment shows that, yes, they conjured a ghost. They conjured a, 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 this. They gave him a name. They gave this. They, how he looked, gave him a whole life, uh, and this became real. It was brought into the real world through the power of belief. They proved, on a shadow of a doubt, that through the power of belief, that we can change our environment. We can bring something physical into our environment. So we have to question now through some of the studies that we were involved in in the 1990s, like taking people into buildings and telling them that it was haunted and all sorts. We give them prior knowledge and expectation that the two main things that people should never have when they're out there looking for paranormal phenomena. Prior knowledge and expectation are the worst things to have. However, if you have enough of it, people will devoutly believe that is a haunted location when it isn't. And what happens over a period of time, it becomes haunted. Paranormal phenomena starts to get witnessed. Are we conjured? Can we conjure this phenomena? I think probably we can. So we have to really start to sit back and say, well, how, right across the scale, where do we, can we apply this in the ufological realm? Well, we look at a C-75 incident. You know, Stephen Greer's meditation groups of five, six people. They go out to a certain location and they meditate for three, four hours, all hoping, all devoutly believing that, they, uh, that they're going to have contact with some type of light that's going to appear in the sky. And what happens? A light appears in the sky. Are we dealing with a true phenomenon here? I don't know. Or could we be dealing with a conjured phenomenon? Absolutely. Because we know it happens in other aspects, be it devout Catholic people who believe they have the wounds of Christ appear on them. It was very interesting when two science guys in the 1990s said, well, there's absolutely no way Christ could have been, would have been nailed through the palms. It just wouldn't have worked. In fact, the documentation that we have shows that they more likely were nailed through the wrists. And what, what happened? About 60 odd percent of of devout Catholics who had stigmata appearing on them on a reg on over a yearly basis, the phenomena moved. The phenomena moved from the palms to the wrists. So we have to say that power belief has a huge connection. We've done tests ourselves by putting people under hypnosis and putting a two pence piece on their arm and say, and tell him that it's quite hot and to watch a blister appear. We know through see some of these tests that the power belief overrules everything overrules in our environment we can change our environment through the power of belief tests have been carried out in people which are lucky and they can change the way things happen in their environment simply because they can think of the outcomes what their outcome is going to be they're very very positive people and what happens is you often question why they're so lucky why are they always winning the lottery and doing things like that you know it's great when you can do that but they are somehow changing their environment. And on the random number generators, which are set up, these are these large machines that drop balls into this machine and they're supposed to fall randomly. They don't. They do not fall randomly in front of these people. In fact, they fall in their favour time and time again, which shows that the only way you can conclude this is that they are somehow affecting the outcome in their environment, their reality. So we had to really question the limits and capabilities of the human mind. You know, what are we really in connection with? Are we attributed to this phenomenon? Do we connect with it? Is it a conduit? Do they need us to survive? Is it a, a combination? Is, there, is there something happening between us and the phenomena where we have to coexist? We have to ask all these new questions now. We have to conduct all these new surveys or new tests, but we are slowly pushing forward with new theories, new ideas into where we currently are of our understanding of the paranormal and the ufological. And really, are we dealing with one phenomenon here? It seems to be varied in different ways because there is one main headline that comes from most experiences, and that is we are, are here to make sure that the earth is okay, that there's damage being done to the earth, that we want, to, want it to stop, we want it to make a better place, we have concerns for the environment. There's like this underlying deliverance of information. No matter what type of entity you see, no matter what type of craft it is, no matter where they say they come from, there is, seems to be one underlying message here. Is that the true 
message? Are we getting, is it, or is it a script? Is it a script across the whole board to say, okay, this is what you say to the humans. That's, you know, that's all you need to do. You know, you go about what you want to do. You go ahead with your agenda and, but this is the delivering line. It could be because it's so varied and it's, it's, it's strangely profound to see so many people having such varied types of experiences with different type of entities, which deliver the same message over and over again. And what's really intriguing is the fact is that when these messages are delivered, these people, the, the, the people who have these experiences will say, well, it's a positive experience. And we've interviewed many experiences and we say, well, okay, can you please tell me and explain your positive experience? And when it really boils down to is that most of them were saying it was a positive experience because it wasn't a negative experience. They certainly identified the difference by not having a negative experience. There seems to be this seesaw effect, none of which were ever calculating the middle ground, which could be this agenda here. And really, probably they don't care what you think, if it's a, a bad experience or a good experience. It's how you might perceive that incident or what they may lead you to believe that incident might consist of. I've taught all over the all over the world in different countries over the years, lecturing, and I have come across different people, different places. Some places, it's all love and light. It's all these things are angelic beings. It's all about love. It's all about light. And they would typically refuse to accept the fact that all these UFO incidents are not all love and light. We want to take the Calaris UFO incident from the 1970s, where beams of light came down uh, and hit people. In fact, there was no hiding from them. The people in a small village off the island of Brazil from 1977-78 were plagued uh, consistently every night by this phenomena, firing these pencil beam lights down there was no evading them they thought they could run off into the into the homes and hide no the this this beams of light traveled through the house people witnessed the light coming through the wall hitting them on the chest on their arms and paralyzed they could not move whilst this beam was on them for several seconds several excruciating painful seconds and what that happened what that left them with was pit holes of scars on them, small, tiny holes. But what was very interesting is that these were suffering from illnesses afterwards, depletion in energies, nausea, and then actually a chemical and biological changes were taking place as well. Now, what's interesting, I talked with very well-known researcher and uh, news correspondent George Knapp, who's been involved in the, in the UFO subjects. He's talked about Bob Lazar and Skinwalker Ranch for many, many years. Pe many people in the subject of ufology will know him uh, from his radio show in, in Las Vegas. Now, myself and George are close, very close friends, and George came out to see me um, a few months ago when I was lecturing in, in Conscious Life Expo. He drove all the way, I think it was talking about five and a half hours to go drive all the way from Las Vegas to to, to LA just to, to, to sit down with us and have a discussion about some of the things he knows, some of the things we know. And one of some of the things that we talked about, which was really, really interesting, I can't, I can't go into all of it at this moment in time, but some, some of it was about that the United States government we're releasing some information over the next week or two about the statistics from the analysis carried out on the people that suffered at the Kolaris UFO incident during 1977 to 78. And he said, Steve, read between the lines. I just couldn't understand what George was saying. What was he saying about read between lines? What's going on there? And I suddenly realized what, when I saw what was released from the, from, from the US government about these statistics, I just knew exactly, exactly what he was saying. Because George knew our statistics. We got our statistics from hospital records. We got our statistics from people that were on the ground at the time. We got our statistics from the researchers went right in there first time. One of those was AJ Gerard, who was a very prolific UFO um, uh, researcher. He also runs a, a magazine, UFO magazine from Brazil, and he was heavily involved in that case. And he will exactly say this, the same thing we do, is that the amount of people which were victimized and had and hospitalized was over a thousand. It was possibly pushing 1,200 people in that village. And that's a lot of people. Taking in consideration the UFOs came from the sea, in a positive magnetic anomaly, I'll just put that in there for so, 
And every night they came into town which was not policed and had no military. This poor little town was vulnerable. And what they did is that the perfect agenda came in under the darkness, cover of darkness, and attacked, simply, just literally attacked these people out of nowhere. They have no idea. There was absolute panic. In fact, people fled the island, left everything behind because they feared for their lives. Eventually, the military did get involved and they ran in, uh, an investigation, which probably turned into the most world's most significant contact case between something which might be referred to as entities from these objects and the, U and, and the military. And, uh, and that was became not um, Project Plato or Project Saucer. Uh, plenty of information on the internet about that, uh, and it has been released photography, and somebody reported incidents from there. And it's absolutely remarkable what went on there. It makes Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters film look like a Toy Story movie. I mean, it was just it was just ridiculous what was going on there. But the purpose it was a purpose place where we took place this agenda of doing this in that location was very very purposeful. Like I said, they had no military presence at that moment, in that the location, no policing. There was nothing to stop, nothing to help save these people. And of course, this went on for a duration of time. Now, what's interesting is that the US government changed the statistics on purpose on the stats. They released information to say that uh, only 37 victims, one of which died. Uh, and they said that was accidental and it wasn't. They died from the, the they died from the, the problems of this experience of that they had this encounter and uh, they died they simply weren't strong enough to to live through the trauma uh, as as direct association to what happened 37 victims no oh, <laughs> try pushing over a thousand 1200 victims was the true amount but most of all most of all what was the most important thing here was the fact is is that we know from the reports from the hospital data data and the incidents and the documentation and the people on the ground that every single person that had that experience of this beam of light hitting them most of them was 80 to 90 percent of these people were suffering from anemia in fact the iron was taken from the bodies and for some reason the united states government when releasing the stats changed it to five percent which is a ridiculously low amount compared to the data. And we have to question why. We have to question why was it altered? And we, the only reason why I can say that is that because they don't want us to know. And why don't they want us to know about that? These people which were attacked were all suffering from anemia and the iron was taken from the bodies because we're back to the old story. We're back to the old things documented through evidence, through research over the years about how the phenomena evades iron. This very same iron it's in our bodies. The very same thing that was taken out. I believe, and many, and I'm not the only researcher to admit this, if you ask them, that many of us believe the iron was taken from the bodies because they were being prepped for further contact. And I don't know if that contact was going to be good, taking into consideration how it first initiated with this beam of light, which was extremely excruciatingly painful and leaving people in a position where they could die from weakness, let alone the alterations in the chemical and biological system. But it's not a singular experience. The exactly the same thing happened in India some years later. Small town, not police, no military. In the middle of the night, these objects came and pounced upon these people in their sleep, firing these pencil beams of light and doing exactly the same. And yes, same thing happened again. People died, people severely injured, and it was covered over. It was covered over by the, the authorities, the Indian authorities, the Indian government. And in fact, they put a clamp on even some of the press. The initial reports that came out show shock, horror, UFO attacks, people dying, da 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 da. And then a week or so later, it all got changed into. Get this, get this, Andrew. It all got changed into a swarm of bee attack. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. Don't know where they come up with the stories, but it's just far from a swarm of bees. When you actually get the talk to the people, the researchers, the doctors, the hospital reports, the people on the ground, no, it was exactly the same as the Kalaus UFO incident. So we, so when we're out and about and we are travelling around and we talk to people and we say, okay, please. Look at this phenomenon as a whole. 
don't just pick one side of it and say it's all love and light because sometimes it's not all love and light and we also know that some of this phenomena can glamour in a sense of speaking they can put on a show for you beautiful colors but the problem is it's like the magician's hand you're staring at the hand so much that you're not looking at the left one and what's happening behind us in our environment, what's taking place, people have been drawn to phenomena and not had good experiences. And people will report that, experiences will report that. And they go on to have those throughout their lives over and over again. Sometimes it isn't all love and light. Now it's very difficult, it's very difficult. And I can only say to people is that when you want to go out there and start looking at this phenomena, true phenomena, and go to these places, and you want to be a UFO investigator, and our people still want to do that, is that there is a word in a warning. A word of warning should be given. There should be a health and safety rules to this. This absolutely. Look at this, some of these phenomena purposely ruin people's lives. For years and years and years, you talk to contact experiences, which go through harrowing forms of hypnogression, just because they cannot deal with what's happened to them and continuing to happen to them. To them, their lives are ruined. That's not a good phenomena. That's not something I would like to have. So there is a word of warning. There's, people need to have a guard up. And what we've found, and what we do as a practice now, that when we go to these locations, these positive magnetic anomalies, we don't know. I don't know. I've witnessed this phenomenon countless times, but I don't know if it's going to be a good experience or a bad experience. But I'd like to be armed. So what we tend to do is that... <laughs> We, we don't know if it works, but we always carry iron with us. That's one thing. We always wear iron around our, our necks just for, just in case. don't know if it's a placebo, but just in case. But apart from that, the science side is that we do restrain ourselves for up to 72 hours of not having refined sugar in our system. Refined sugar is a terrible thing. If anybody who wants to do research on about refined sugar, is the fact is, is that it's a poison. It's literally is a poison to our bodies. It's not anything, not a single 0.1% of anything in refined sugar that's good for the body. It can't use it. It doesn't like it. In fact, it doesn't do our bodies any good whatsoever. And yet, it's forced down our necks and children's necks every day of the week. It's eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. And that's all it does. And, and it's everywhere. And we can't get out of that society the way things are with refined sugar. But the problem for us, the biggest problem, is that it causes severe adrenal weakness. In other words, our fight or flight response is not going to kick in. So this is it, our listeners. We say to our guys out there, if you want to be UFO investigators and something really, it really happens, can you trust your own mechanism to say this is not good? I don't should I shouldn't be here. That mechanism is the galvanic skin. Um, the the galv your skin is an organism. It's the biggest organism of the body, and um, what it does is it tells us. It gives us information. We knew this from tests carried out by psychological tests some years back when people were put in front of television screens shown images and it was a nice image of a cuddly bear and then a butterfly and then some nice flowers and then all of a sudden a horrific scene but what happened was over a period of an hour or so the skin started reacting before the image a bad image came up the skin was reacting to something that was going to happen and that is the galvanic skin resistance. It's that old survival sense we have that we don't tend to use anymore because people just tend to go to the shopping mall to survive these days. <laughs> but nonetheless, it is that old survival sense kicking in from the year old, years old, which we probably relied on. We probably did have predators that watched us from afar and we did have that feeling we're being watched and we did have those warning devices. Well, they are still there within us. But the problematics of trying to identify that with the amount of refined sugar we have, it's going to be next to impossible. So I'd say at least for 72 hours, refined sugar, stay away from it because we should be relying on that fight or flight response. And I say to people, when you have it, it is not what people have realized over the years. They're thinking that, oh, well, that's because I'm scared. Am I getting that? Response. No, it's the other way around. It's your body reacting and you interpreting it as fear not that fear causes that sensation 
is the wrong way round. Listening to the body during those experiences. And sometimes you get some wonderful light shows in the skies. But when you feel that fight or flight, when suddenly all those hairs start sticking up on your arm, that's your, that's just your body saying something isn't right people are, i've talked to experiences that have seen little gills with and, and they're trying to work out is it a little girl or is it something else you know or is it an animal you know what is that i, I can't understand what this and the hairs are up the skins are up and it's the, the body's saying no the body's saying this is not what you are perceiving it is something else because people do have some good experiences occasionally well i'll say good experience i say it wasn't a bad experience just because nothing happened and they don't get that reaction some people don't but i'd say certainly listen to the body if it does and when those hairs start prickling up it's your body saying back off don't go towards the lovely lights start to back off a little bit because sometimes we have to have these warning signals this isn't not you don't hear about too many of the bad incidents because they get covered up you hear about the great incidents you know or people having wonderful experiences but the bad incidents don't get out they don't get circulated as well but they're out there and they are dangerous and they continue to be so we can we truly identify this phenomenon we're dealing with i don't know um, I, well, there's still so much to learn more in this subject, be it the paranormal, the supernatural, the metaphysical, super spiritual, call it what you will. But it seems to be all connected. It seems to be that these things are coming through another, from w one reality or another. One recent Harvard professor turns around and recently and said the same thing that other Harvard professors said in, from 2007 in Science magazine, saying that there is evidence that there are realities very, very close to ours. And the evidence lies within an unusual sapping of gravity. Now that's very interesting because when some of these UFOs appear, they seem to leave a gravity well. It's affected and it can be measured with the right type of equipment. It can be measured. You can even see the effects from a laser arc test. These small lasers that people are using to fire up in the sky. Forget it. Fasten it to your tripod. Send it across the anomaly, low, the, anomaly, the anomaly zone and watch to see if you have a gravity well. If it does, it will stretch that line like a bow of an arrow. You know, the string will be going left and right. The target of the of the laser will move off its grid. You will see evidence of that gravity well happening. We've done tests. We've got it on film. We know it exists. Other researchers do. Then maybe not many are talking about it, but it's out there. And there is evidence of the effect in the environment because when they manifest, something has to dip, disappear from the environment. Two things can't exist in the same place at the same time. So something's taken for its replacement. And when these objects are manifest, people have seen them at night. The reports, people have seen these manifesting UFOs at night close to the ground. What happens? The car headlights start to bend towards this object because the gravity well is so large that it affects light waves. Not even light can affect gravity. Uh, and there are evidence of these incidents and they're still continuing today. So they are affecting the environment. They tend to happen for about, oh, well, I believe 48, 72 hours. They start to dissipate because we we visited locations after three, four days. It's not there, uh, but has been there at least for 48 hours. So we do know uh, the last place was in Arizona. Oh no, it was not. I yeah, tell a lie. Yeah, the last place was in Palm Springs where that incident happened and one before that was Arizona. And yes, they are happening in these unusual areas. There isn't many people around, but that's the base. That's where they are. They avoid, they like to avoid uh, contact with us on many occasions. They like to just get on what they're doing, whatever they're doing. And sometimes if you're in a light location and the right time, the right place, you are ha and have the capabilities to be able to capture this, the evidence to show that these gravity wells exist. And because of this new, these new areas of research, more and more people need to kind of be going out there and doing some studies and finding out what they think, what could be going on. But one thing is for sure, there is a paranormal undertone today. There are attributes, be it the spiritual, supernatural, be it the conscious connection that people have with this phenomena. Um, there are people, and it's happened to us, you know, we've, we've been there and we've, We've been there for, we, we're, you know, UFO investigators 30 odd years in now. Uh, same for most of the researchers that I work with on the on Project Doorway. Um, we get fed up after 30 minutes. We get a bit impatient. You know, we've been, we, we, we're not going to turn up in 30 minutes. We're going. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we get this sudden inclination. And it's not just us. It's not just me. It might be another one or somebody else. And so we've all just got this sudden inclination. We, we need to put the cameras away. So we put the cameras away. And as soon as we shut that trunk, 
bang, they appear. And uh, and that's happened numerous times. So there's, it's like they know that we're wanting to film them or capture them, and sometimes they just won't let us. On other occasions, they'll put on a lovely little display for us and let us take. So it's, it's not always the same, but what is the same is that the fact that they seem to have the capabilities of knowing what we want, knowing what we're doing, and it's totally up to them. They seem to govern the skies. They seem to govern the, the the whole situation of that experience because they know or can read our attributions. They know what our intents are. Uh, so basically, we really are out of our own comfort zone there. We're not in control of this, these experiences. I doubt we we'll probably ever will be because they'll probably always be one step ahead. Um, but one thing is for sure is that the, we don't know what the phenomena at this moment constitutes. We If we go back from a hundred years or a thousand years it doesn't really matter they seem to constitute the same thing but we don't know uh if it's just a gender do they want to do something good or they have to do something bad one thing is sure they just seem to be doing whatever they want to do and they don't really care uh, they're not care if they're seen sometimes uh, even though other other times are completely hyper evasive uh and as for identifying these things well it depends on where you are there's one attribute i can say that doesn't seem to fit any technological advancement that we have. And that is the fact that some of this phenomena, when it materializes and dematerializes, splits into two, um, changes its shape, it morphs, it interacts with you in a conscious level. That seems to be the phenomena. That seems to represent something hugely profound. What we're not seeing is that in, in our technology. What we are seeing is amazing craft, different types, different shapes and sizes, moving at incredible speeds in, in remote locations, which might constitute the fact that those are advanced technological crafts that we might be manufacturing and flying around now. Uh, so there is a divide between these two phenomena, but to the general observer in the, you know, who's going to be look up in the sky and see something strange, they're just going to shout UFO many a times. And I think to the advantage of the of, of, of the military that are involved in flying these things, some parts of them at least, uh, is, an advance, is, is an advantage because it takes the blame away from them straight away. Nobody's going to be talking about exotic um, secret craft being flown. And as I said about British Aerospace in the UK, when I went to visit them and talk about Tyrannus, which is a unmanned aerial vehicle, it's no pilot. It looks like a miniature stealth fighter. It's small and it's all black and it's triangular. And we've had strange, profound sightings up and down the Pennines in the UK, which stretched the uh, northern part of the country. And they said, oh, no, we don't test fly in the Tyrannus in the UK. And we've only had it here for 20 odd years. No, no, we put it onto a galaxy jet, uh, a galaxy plane, um, a transporter. And we fly it to the US and we test flight there. <laughs> and I laughed and said to this guy, I said, are you serious? How much money is that going to cost? Isn't it easy to just fly it under the darkness of night and nobody would ever know? And he, and he went very red, turned around, walked away. <laughs> you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it is all cost. And I can tell you, if, if I was putting my hand in my pocket, I'd be flying it secretly in the middle of the night. And I don't care if people are reporting it as a UFO or not. It takes the blame away from me. Um, I certainly won't be paying the expense and putting all that time together to put it on a galaxy transporter to fly it to the United States to test flight there or to get the results and fly it back. And that's just a preposterous idea. But this is the stuff that they tell people. So, yes, there's going to be misidentifications out there, but there are true phenomena. And we still have the UFO phenomena taking place in the UK. It's... It still happens, doesn't get reported as much, uh, but that's the reporting of it. But the phenomenon, I believe, is still taking place, just as it is in the United States. Um, seems to be the hotspot areas at the moment is the coastal regions of Mexico and San Diego. Uh, but like I say, 150 miles out there at sea, there's some strange stuff going on. And it could be that we're test flying some exotic craft out there. Um, but at the same time, when we have exotic craft, we could also have the real phenomena just doing what they do, being nosy, as they have done for hundreds of years, like they did in the 1940s, probably as Foo Fighters, just being nosy. But if you want to take the strange lights that are seen over Mexico City, which I assume to be spheres or orbs of light or aircraft, or the Foo Fighters, the strange lights that appeared during the Second World War, we thought they were the Germans, and the Germans thought they were ours. 
Uh, nobody really knows what they were. The same things that were seen during the Gulf War, which was reported by three mainstream news outlets. Whilst the Scud missiles were going left, right and centre over Baghdad, these things hung over the sky, monitoring, watching as it unfolded. And even reporters from three major major stations reported on what are those things in the sky hovering just sat there watching these strange lights and uh, it was never concluded but they all said the same thing they seem to monitor our events monitor our wars and so on and so forth but it's the very same things have been reported in paranormal occurrences light phenomena signs of basketballs which seem to intelligent move around buildings and through doorways what is it if it's not the same thing as a ball of light that you might see outside and call a ufo we really have to start thinking about putting these bricks together, looking at a whole picture and coming up with some new answers. So this is leading into Project Doorway, which is further research into the realm of the studies of advanced uh, ufology. Um, the section on Project Doorway has been placed into a new course. It's a new course out there. It's called the UITC, UFO Investigators Training Course for the 21st Century. It's advanced studies into, anom uh, into um, aviation, uh, anomalous aviation uh, phenomena. And of course, introducing into that is Project Doorway and, uh, and how we can conduct further research and analysis and investigation into those areas. Um, and the UITC course is something which is available worldwide by correspondent. And people can obtain that from our Phenomena Magazine website, uh, which, Andrew, you mentioned that earlier, didn't you, about the Phenomena Magazine. We have the two main sites which we mentioned. The first one was the mapping one, which said KK5. I think you remember me saying that. Uh, that was because it was launched in 2005, that website. And that's all about the organization. And Phenomena Magazine is all about the magazine. But on that site, phenomenamagazine.co.uk, you'll find a section which says Stellar Courses. And it tells you about the course, and people can obtain it. Um, and it goes out, like I say, worldwide. It's also in Spanish for, for our for our, our friends in, in Spain and those speaking languages, uh, should they want to actually do the courses as well. Uh, but we also put our information from our research and investigations straight into the magazines, which get currently distributed worldwide every month. Uh, so we really are trying to teach people and tell people about some of the new research that can be done. And we can actually go back now and start looking at older cases again and saying, well, hang on a second. You know, there was much more going on than just what was actually reported here. And I think it's really important that we start to get a better grip on this because we, at this moment, the UFO subject is very static and all we have is data in visual sense coming through. It's just adding, like photographs and videos, adding another stone to the mountain we've already got. Is it really getting us any closer to the truth? No. Do we really need to? I believe so. And I think we've got to open up all these other doors to realise where we've got to go, what we've got to do, and try and get some answers about this most profound subject that's probably ever going to exist in, in today's society. Wow, dude, that was amazing. All those people who said I uh, fill us my guess too much will be saying that with this show. It's amazing you were able to <laughs> talk that long for two hours, that considering it's one in the morning at your time. I'm very impressed. But um, before we close this show, yeah. um, there is one question in particular that I need to point out, uh, get your take on. And I also want to do a quick um, reading here of something that mm. I um, – copied and pasted because I think it's significant enough to point on my show. First of all, you mentioned the Unidentified series. Mm. Um, thing about Luis Elizondo, love him, hate him. Yeah. The reason I say hate him is because he cries home to mama because he <laughs> will cite the um, government um, laws that say he can't disclose things when <laughs> yes. common sense and checks and balances show that those laws do not trump the laws mm -hmm. that say that he does have the right to disclose information that the government has absolutely no authority to disclose. <laughs> and so I sense a little fear in him. And it could the, the the way the show ended. I mean, call it bittersweet, call it gut wrenching, whatever. I mean, the, I saw every episode in that series, and the yeah. last episode, the way it ended, someone asked uh, Luis, "Do you think people can handle the truth?" And all Luis did was stand up, walk away, didn't give an I answer. I know he should have given an ended. answer. Yeah, and, I, I would. Well, I would have given an answer. Yeah, and the thing. Well, that leads into what I want to read here, and then after I read this, I'll give your take, and then we'll call it a, a call to show. This is something that um. Akashic Records reader Andrew Bartis, my number one source of info, um, said, said regarding the future, uh, regarding humanity getting the truth um, out, disclosing it, and how we handle it. And it reads, he, wrote, he called it the future with a question mark after the word future. 
and it reads, and I quote, You want to know what it's going to be like in the future? It's about saving our culture. It's about cleaning up our planet. You know, the financial system can be taken care of. It's already been thought of. But to implement a new financial system means there has to be a time for us as a human species to let down, to sleep, to heal, okay? There was a time when human awakening began on another timeline. On another previous timeline genocide during the second paradox where we made it to 2004 and our species was told about UFOs and it was so harsh in the way that it came through. Not that the media did it wrong and during their breakdown it was okay. Our people, ourself, were so confounded by the lies that many of them just stopped living and the whole society and the whole structure fell apart and that cannot happen. There cannot be a cultural breakdown. Something of our food has to survive. Something of the way we live has to survive. There was incredibly beautiful lifetimes here. It has not all been dark. It is just propaganda that has made it look that way. Mm. Unquote. So that's, I think, a good way to finish it. Do you have any statements about that? Do you think uh, maybe he's onto something there? I think uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, we know... I mean, obviously, we have to always ask the question, you know, do we constitute to this phenomena? You know, is it simply down to belief? Do we conjure these things? Is it topers? You know, if we removed, would we remain with a phenomena? This is the biggest question of all. Can we handle the truth? I would have answered, you know, I would say a majority of people now can. There's certainly public programs now. There's there's national curriculum in in the UK schools now to teach eight-year-olds what UFOs are. They create crash crash scenes. They get real police officers out, real CSI guys. And they talk to children about the hazards of UFOs. It's in the UK national curriculum to teach what children about this, as it is in Australia. There there is an undertone of developing of disclosure. It has been for a long time because I don't think they want another Roswell incident. Not nowadays, not if something comes down the town because a everyone's got a mobile phone b it'll be on the internet in three seconds and three nobody's got really much respect for military officers to say don't talk about it anymore and, and this is the biggest problem that we have nowadays and i think there is some concern with the governments to say okay accidents happen it's such law and even whatever they are they seem to make mistakes occasionally and if that happens how are we going to do it? Well, the biggest problem is to develop a plan to put it in thought and in mind 24 hours a day, and not just for us, but our growing children. And that is everywhere. It's in food, cereal bars, TV shows, comics, magazines, movies, everywhere, every day. The word aspects of aliens, UFOs is, is just common language. When people see a UFO now, they'll go and report it to the mother. The following day, they're thinking, okay, what am I going to have for dinner? They've shrugged the shoulders. They think nothing more of it, and the time goes on. You know, it's, it's the concept of, of this subject has changed drastically over the years. Its acceptance levels has drastically changed. But for me, there is an undertone of something happening. And uh, I think there's a, I've watched that show over and over. And I, I, I have to watch it over and over because I have to try and digest it not just the information but the trend and it does seem to be certain trends that were traveling through that tv show i certainly say but there was a little bit of disinformation going out there there was mentioned from the ttsa that was positive magnetic anomalies around guatapulo island that's not true there was there is no positive magnetic anomalies around there um is that for a reason is that done purposely when the tcsa first came out and announced they were coming out they released a photograph of the tic tac ufo the Tic Tac UFO photograph, and it was a photograph with a blue background behind it, a big silver thing. Well, <laughs> I was very frustrated, as you can well imagine, because that particular photograph was from, from my investigation in 2005 in Manchester. And I thought to myself, how does the, and they, went, they did a big, big conference to thousands of people showing this on screen. I wrote to them, the TTSA, and I said, guys, you're showing our photograph from our case in 2005 in, in, in Manchester, it's nothing to do with the Tic Tac UFO. In fact, the photograph has been manipulated to make the sky look darker, make it look like the sea, as if it was a photograph that was taken from above, looking down on the Tic Tac as it was over the ocean. It was manipulated purposely. How did it get in there? Three months it took me. Three months to keep going at them, saying, you're going wrong, you've got the wrong information out, it's being distributed everywhere, or the press has picked up on it. They never, ever once replied. Eventually, I had to pick up the phone to George Knapp, I had to pick up the phone to reporters and report it, and then the reporters went to them and pursued it, and then they took it down with a little impl- little statement saying, sorry, we made a mistake. Well, that deserves an explanation, Diver- des- des- deserves 
Where did it come from? Who submitted it? Why was it manipulated? That photograph was only on the internet in one place, one website I put up there in 2005. So that's how I got involved in TTSA and have been ever since. I'm watching and I'm, I'm looking at the the TV show very, very uh, over and over many times just to see about the trends. Is the information, is it disinformation? I don't know. The problem is, is that, you know, there's a media aspect to this phenomena. And of course, sometimes it can be drastically different than what is really out there in the real world. Um, I have to question everything from my point and my stand. But I would certainly say, yes, there is good in this world. There is bad in this world. But I think that we might be directly associated to it. If people think more positive about things, will positive experiences happen? Very possible. But we live in a society where it drills you down, brings you down and breeds negativity. And now, whilst we'll continue to do that, I think we've got a growing concern about the way we live, how humanity will develop, and of course, our own planet. And uh, But it, one thing is for sure, there's one, one very one last, lasting phenomenon, which is the UFO phenomenon. It doesn't seem that it's going anywhere away anytime soon. It certainly seems to been, been here as long as I can think of, certainly probably before uh, documentation, historical documentation at least. So, But it's just a profound phenomenon. And of course, we haven't got all the answers, but we're, we're chiseling away. We're trying our best. <laughs> Yeah, with that said, one more thing before we call the show, uh, that thing you've mentioned about the Area 51 thing, um, if that does actually happen, the thing, it's scheduled to happen the day before the fall mm. equinox, according to the Facebook thing. I actually said at a a Alien Con in Los Angeles um, that I would be happy to lead my fat ass in front of a <laughs> Million Man March crusade on Area 51. I don't think the guy who created the Facebook event got that idea from me, considering he lives in Australia. <laughs> but um, if that does happen, I kind of do have an obligation to show up at the stampede mm. on Area 51. However, some people who... Um, uh, include people at my job and including people who listen to my show have actually pleaded that I put myself in the middle of the stampede and up the front <laughs> so I don't get killed because I think I'm too much of a yeah. valuable asset to my, the, my job and also society so maybe I yeah. will respect them but um, I actually do hope that something does come out of Oh, that I'm, I'm hoping too. I mean, it'd yeah. be certainly interesting to see what develops because I think it'd be good to show that at the end of the day, the public have the right and that is where the power lies and the government should fear that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we are the masses and it's they're, they're supposed to be there in place for us. And at the end of the day, I'm wondering how they'd accept that, how they deal with that because that's a real big problem for them. No question. So, well, we've gone past two hours. Human beings by nature have lousy attention spans. So, uh, <laughs> but you're a fascinating guest who will certainly get, uh, increase the view count more so than some of my other um, recent guests who, with all due respect to them, they don't have as much of a household name as Stephen Mara does. So I'm sure that <laughs> this will be a popular video. I, I will upload it by midnight tomorrow at the absolute latest. I'll um, send it to you on Facebook when I do, and you're more than welcome to um, promote and spread it out everywhere so the word gets out. Um, and again, thank Absolutely. you. For covering for me for two hours so my big mouth didn't have to uh, <laughs> babble away so uh, that was uh, pretty impressive and I'm sure that nobody will consider this a boring radio show because the stuff uh, you were talking about was eye-popping to say the least the way you <laughs> talked about it so thank you very <laughs> thank much thank you Andrew thank take you care good night and enjoy the rest of your research and your Trek Thought Infinite Consciousness take care All right. thank you Andrew